different weights, but I'm always with a scarf. <laughs> That's my signature. Wow. There I we go. That. I love that. Okay. Uh, so I use my earrings as my signature. Mm -hmm. Yes, you look great in them too. <laughs> I don't look so great um, anymore in earrings, so you need something different at different times of life. <laughs> That's true. That is absolutely work of art, and uh, perfect. Well, I do have beautiful scars, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm just. I have an unreasonable connection, really an unreasonable collection. I I'm a minimalist in every other way, but the scarves and maybe the books, <laughs> too many. So uh, I will just wait for like a few more seconds mm -hmm. for people to join. Okay. And uh, I, you know, this podcast is for women, focused on women. And as you can mm -hmm. imagine, most women are extremely busy. So most of the time women mm -hmm. listen to it, they download it and listen to it. Mm -hmm. Or they listen to yep. it on YouTube. So the same with my podcast, by the way. I'm going to adjust the height of this because it's better for the video. Um, the same with my podcast. Almost nobody listens live. Um, almost everybody uh, picks it up later. So, yeah. 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 Okay. So that while we're waiting, tell me a little more about your company, the work that you're doing there. Huh. Uh, it is, I think it is my turn to ask questions, but uh, I will answer yours too. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking we're waiting for others. We might as well talk. So, yes. Yeah, so, uh, I, I will tell you about Empower Women series, mm -hmm. which is a social initiative by Refine and Focus, which mm -hmm. is the main company. And uh, so, in Empower Women series, what we try to do is bring conversations with uh, you know very inspiring women like you mm -hmm. to aspiring women leaders. Because most of the time, women don't have time for you know the coaching or mentoring and everything else that men have time for. Mm -hmm. So this is my effort to bring the real life stories, the real life experiences to yes. them. This is exactly correct. Exactly correct. Um, women um, lack time, and that means that they will lack uh, a great deal of assets that men bring to both entrepreneurship and careers. And until we balance the, if you will, unpaid labor, we're not going to balance that issue. So very, very complicated because balancing the unpaid labor has been around for eons. Yes. Right. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. there, there is much more awareness on that, you know, invisible labor, which is called as, which is not, yes. only, not only at home, but it is also at the workplace. So we will talk about all those things today is mm -hmm. my goal. I mm -hmm. obviously want to talk about, uh, uh, talk about your career, your life, ask mm -hmm. questions about uh, how you did it and how can it be, what can we learn from you, even from your, you know, obviously from your successes, but also from mm -hmm. your others. Oh, yeah. I've, I've got a, a podcast called CEO Coach. It went for 11 years every week live wherever I was in the world, sometimes from midnight and one o'clock in Southeast Asia. Right? It was all the mistakes I ever made, so you don't have to make them. I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> 11 years. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no. In truth, it covered more, of course, but it was a lot of it that said, what could I have done better? What did I not know when I needed to know it? And how do I share that? So it was good work. It was good work. And now I do it through VC Confidential, which I, I shut down the CEO coach and opened VC Confidential uh, in May of 2020. So that one is all about venture capital, because if you're an entrepreneur, that is the burning question. How do we do this capital? Yes. So know, how do we manage it? How do we raise it? Yeah. I, I would say that uh, thank you for, you know, uh, sharing about your old podcast and new podcast, <laughs> because in spite of uh, knowing everything, I know so much about CEO coach that I did not know about VC Confidential. It's- Oh, okay. 
Yeah, yeah, you should check into this one too if you're running your own company, if it's going to be scalable in any way. Capitalization of a company is far beyond conventional venture capital. Right. right. Um, venture conventional venture capital. I keep using this term conventional venture capital. And that's because this is the kind of venture capital that says, I hand you money, you hand me stock. Then we wait to the end. And if you sell or go to have an IPO, then I get my money back. Generally, it was the idea was, you know, oh, three to five years, unicorn companies and so on and so forth. The truth of the matter is far from that. It's not good for investors. It's not good for entrepreneurs. And it certainly isn't good for the communities in which they are supposed to thrive. So mm -hmm. if you want, I'll dive into some numbers. Yes. Just give me one second. I just remembered that I, ne I never, you obviously don't need an introduction, but I never introduced you. So let me get do that. <laughs> And that should be the first thing that we should talk about, which is conventional VC and difference mm -hmm. between conventional and non-conventional VC and uh, what your thoughts on it. So uh, welcome, everyone. If you are listening to us live or if you're going to listen to this recorded version of my today's uh, conversation with fabulous Jillian Musing, Musing. I, I did practice saying it. Because <laughs> it. Think of it as music, almost music. like music. <laughs> Very yeah. close. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, uh, you know, there are certain names that you always read them, but you never say them aloud. It's one of those That's names. That's right. Yeah. That's true. Um, for us, it has always been Jillian. So we are going to talk to Jillian in our Empowered Women series. As all of you know, it's a social initiative of uh, Refine and Focus. And this is our effort to bring, bring inspiring and accomplished women like Jillian, their experiences, their conversations to inspiring not only women leaders, but all leaders and learn from their successes and their failures and all their overall experiences. And that's why we bring bold people like Jillian who are not shy to talk about their failures. And that's true. <laughs> I'm happy to do it. <laughs> yes. And I will tell you one thing about today's conversation is don't hold any questions back. I mean, just ask anything, any questions that you have about startup, startup life, venture capital, anything that you have, or even your life. Uh, I'm sure Jillian will make the best effort to answer it. <laughs> and with that, yeah. Jillian, let's catch up the point. If you want to say anything to the, uh, our audiences. So I, I come to you with my life experience. I'm 67 years old. What I do today is my opus. This is my last gig, not my first. And so I'm very mindful of that. This is about legacy issues. And most people listening in today will have not reached that stage in their career or their lives. Right? It doesn't mean that I'm going to die at the end of this, but it does mean that I hang up my shoes on the global stage. I've spent a lifetime, as you are all spending your lifetime, building up as much power as possible, if you will, for that last throw of the ball. Whatever you throw at the end, kind of at my stage, is the last throw. It has to take you all the way. Whether it takes me till I'm 80 or 85 to accomplish this last goal, or whether it takes me only two or three years, I don't know. But I know that the strength of what I've built, which would be capital, and you cannot give away what you do not have. So go after that capital, be unabashed and unafraid and unapologetic. Number two, um, the associations, affiliations, um, connections, friendships, right? All of those things, both in business and beyond. And then finally, the skill sets that one acquires over a lifetime. Right. It doesn't mean that I stop here. I'm learning at, at breakneck speed, this world of venture capital. But still, um, all of the things that I have acquired in terms of that experience, as well as the capital and the connections, are going to take me in this last push. So. Um, I come to you with this lifetime of experience as a business operator. I talk a lot about wizards and executors. You can look that up, wizard and executor, and you'll find my name on it. Look at the deck, read it through, it's worth it. A wizard is the idea person, generally a technologist, but not always. 
An executor literally executes on the ideas of wizards and builds a company around them. I've been an executor to brilliant wizards, most notably to my own eldest son, Rand Fishkin. If you're in the world of search engine optimization or similar, you know he is the largest name in search, right? I was the one in the back office. So with that, and, and I left early as well, I launched it. I did not build the whole company. So again, it's that push that sends something on and up and on its way. I had a happy exit in 2012. I formed a company called Outlines Venture Group with Anne Kennedy. In the world of search engine optimization, I was to software as she was to services in the world of SEO. She built the world's largest consortium of digital marketing software, and my company, known as SEO Moz, now known as Moz, is now the world's largest provider of SEO software and digital marketing software. So with it, we built an industry, not just our businesses, and we were anomalies. We were middle-aged mothers with three children each under our belts in a game that was played by children out of college and most of them boys. So it was an interesting space to be. We decided we'd earned the right to have a lifestyle company, so we launched Outlines Venture Group, and like any stool that needs three legs, we said, well, we'll do some uh, consulting. We've made friends all over the world. We'd like to go visit them. We'd like good food and good wine. We'd like to share it with them. That's all it has to pay for. That's fine. Oh, we're not flying coach. All right, so business class tickets over the water. That's good. Then the second thing was to um, take this investment of advisory work and board director work, which we had already done in our previous roles leading our own companies. Remember, we were, again, middle-aged moms. That meant that when we went to conferences, people would come and say, I don't know, I've got snuffles and, uh, you know, do you have head cold medicine and, and my airline ticket doesn't work and, oh, by the way, would you listen to my business plan? So we served on a lot of boards of advisors and boards of directors, just falling in backwards. Now we put walls around it and said, what do we want to invest in, right? Because when you serve on a board, you get a bit of stock. So this was stock in exchange for service, not stock yet, in exchange for capital. Over the coming years, we put in some capital to a few companies as well as our labor, and that seemed fine. I think we did one consulting gig and decided, yeah, we don't actually need to do that. We're not doing that anymore. So, <laughs> so what remained was the advisory work, the board director work in exchange for stock, of course. And we helped these companies to thrive. And we began to learn about the world of investment, starting at the angel stage and moving on to being a venture capitalist. And then finally, we said, well, we give back. It was difficult to build scalable corporations in our time. And so we would preferentially help those who were women trying to do the same. And we thought, of course, it is better now than when we built it. It's easier now. And the answer is not so much. Nowhere near the improvements that we thought would have been made had come to play. In 2015, well, actually 2016, First Round Capital published their 2015 report. And this is where I'll get into the numbers now. They published a 2015 report on their most uh, recent closed 10-year fund. Now, First Round Capital is a massive venture capital firm, so this is a pretty large portfolio. They noted, among other things, that women in their portfolio had returned a 63% higher ROI to the fund. Let that settle in, folks. That's not a rounding figure. That's the kind of blow the top of your head off figure for investors, for entrepreneurs, for banks, for everybody. So we thought, of course, wait a minute, the money is going to start flowing in the right direction now because only 3% of venture capital, give or take, it mops along, right? 3% of venture capital goes to women. Surely 20% is going to go next year. The money follows the money. But it didn't happen. 2016. 2017, 18, 19, and way down to 2.1% in 2020 as women carried the price and the burden of the downturn of global economy, both in their economic careers as well as in entrepreneurship, right? The massive flight of women from the workforce has been staggering not seen since 1946, when they were forced out of companies and back into the homes. And now we see it again. So with those kinds of numbers, let's take a look at 
all of venture capital. On conventionally funded venture capital, and I'll begin actually with how all of this came together. A man by the name of Georges Doriot, who was a French-born American uh, citizen who was a um, professor at Harvard, in 1946 formed a company called ARC with a bunch of his friends. And the object there was to create, if you will, this first conventional venture capital fund, venture capital as we know it today because venture capital has existed for eons, right? It is literally uh, to capitalize a company, a venture. Not a big deal, okay. But in this way, it was as we know it today. When we say VC money, this is what we're talking about. He said, first of all, that the goal was to fund innovation. They were targeting the GIs, men who were coming home from war, with brilliant ideas about technologies that could be built that would be moonshots. We still use that terminology today. These were the technologies or ideas for technologies that would power the human existence on planet Earth for the next century. Pretty good. He thought that 2% of their investments would pan out and the rest would be bust. They were going for wild shots, right? And he had a venture capital model that would take it. They would invest in about 20 companies and they would expect one to go, but they thought really 40 companies or more and so on and so forth, right? You get the idea. In truth, they doubled their output, 4%, almost 3.7 something percent of all companies that are venture funded have a happy exit. That does not mean the unicorn exit. It means a sufficient ROI that it's commensurate with the risk of the asset class. That's all it means. Okay, so now you have to wonder, where's all the rest of that capital going? What's going on here? The answer is 80% of every venture funded company dies within five years, more thereafter. 16% will continue to function and operate, some getting quite solid and big and all of that, but they don't have an exit. They don't sell or have an IPO. And that's the only way VCs get their money back out. You have to sell or have an IPO to liquefy the asset. Huh. So they return nothing to their funds or the investors. And again, a little less than 4% have a happy exit. So the question is begged. Did VCs make a mistake on 96% of their investment decisions? Right? You might chuckle about it. Haha, I never really thought about it that way. But I would postulate, how else would you like to think about it? It is the job of the fund manager to return an ROI to his investors or her investors. Right? And if 96% of them are not doing it, what the hell is going on? But in truth, if you go back to 1946, that was by design, the investment thesis and model. Okay, it's designed to fund moonshots. It is perhaps loosely translatable today to funding the software that would power the next big thing. AI, IOT, blockchain, those kinds of words come to mind and there are others. Right? But it is not designed to capitalize the companies that leverage those softwares to build the very next decent thing. We are not investing in the wrong companies. Conventional venture capital fund managers are not making a mistake on their investment decisions. These are the finest and most promising companies on the planet solving the world's most pressing problems. We're using the wrong funding model. And the funding model is killing the companies. So at the Masters Fund, we looked at a number of things, two things in particular. One, we looked at the fact that women-led, gender-diverse teams are the highest performing teams on the planet. We didn't just stop with first-round capital. More than a quarter of a century of data indicates that in the private markets, women are returning 35% higher ROI to their funds. They exit one to two years sooner. They raise 66% less capital than their male colleagues along the way. And they do all of this on 3% of that venture funding at the Series A. Right, astounding. So like Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire, they're doing everything the guys are doing, dancing backwards and in high heels and doing a better job of it. Um, so women-led, gender diverse teams, that's what we invest in. We have the leisure not to invest in the next Philip Morris. We invest in companies that are building better ways to live and work together. 
Right? So that's what we look for. Very broad definition of the impact to society. Okay. And then, yeah. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for thank okay. you for doing that. And there is a question actually. Avery is asking sure. a question which is related to what you said. This, which is mm -hmm. you know, investing in female-led, uh, women-led companies. Her question yes. is, what? I'll just go, put her question here so we can see it. Which is, what advice would you give to hopeful female entrepreneurs? And have you noticed any difference between male and female-owned companies? Mm -hmm. You just talked about it, and absolutely, <laughs> yes, on on both accounts. Um, but um, I will complete the last thought first. The first thing mm -hmm. we are acting on is the team itself. The second thing we are acting on in terms of our investment is how we invest. And so, yes, we have devised new funding models, models that we believe are more advantageous to both the investor and the entrepreneur, as well as the, uh, the communities in which they survive. Um, we work with something called a structured equity investment model. Um, we know that conventional venture capital isn't for everyone. The first thing that happens when you take conventional venture capital is you make two agreements. One is you work at the pleasure of your board and you can be replaced. Very often you are. There's an excellent TED talk by the founder of Expert Dojo. Expert Dojo. Look at that TED talk. It has all the numbers around how uh, VCs are replacing CEOs. The second thing you agree to is to sell your company as quickly and expeditiously as possible or in very rare instances go public. If you don't wish to sell your company but you want to operate it, right, or if you don't wish to sell it, if you will, as expeditiously as possible, which sometimes means you don't provide maternity or paternity leave. It doesn't provide for, if you will, going beyond the basics to care for one's community, one's customers, and so on, right? You, to optimize the bottom line, the uh, adjusted gross is the object which optimizes one's valuation, right? If your goals diverge from your VC's goals, you may have a problem. And we return to statement number one, you work at the pleasure of your board. So if that's not a good match for you, and it is for some and not for many others who do take venture capital, and they should not, then it's time to look for other venture opportunities, right? Capitalization can be in the form of venture debt, venture equity, in which is redeemable, and that's what we do. And then finally, it can be in the form of sales. I kid you not, most people overlook this. At the very earliest stages, VCers are saying, oh, just get the eyeballs, just get the people, and so on and so forth. This fills that model of investment in which they capitalize the growth of the company, not the revenues of the company capitalizing itself. Do not overlook the possibility that you could sell something, right? Selling something means you have capital that you don't pay back. Right now, the differences between men and women operated companies. Yes, women um, are building uh, smaller companies, fewer global dominating companies, fewer unicorns. The question is begged, do they build smaller companies because their ideas are smaller or their goals are smaller? Or is it because they know damned well they can't get the capital to do it? Hmm. It's interesting. Women don't get the capital, not because the company idea would be lesser or more, uh, said the Swedes. They did uh, studies around this uh, in which women and men presented exactly the same deck and were offered these massive differences in valuation and, of course, massive amounts of no's versus yes at all. Even if they got the yes, it was lower valuations. The question there was why, and it has to do, if you will, with the comfort of um, the investor, right? Humans are comfortable with humans like themselves, okay? Regardless of what the t-shirts say, different is dangerous, right? The t-shirts are saying different isn't dangerous, we should welcome, you know, immigrants and so on. But for human and humanoid history, right, going back thousands to millions of years ago, right, different is dangerous. If a humanoid infant cozies up to a saber-toothed tiger, it doesn't last long. It must instinctively cozy up to its own kind, right? And with that concept of this anthropological behavior, right, we note that it isn't only humans, it's all mammals. 
it's all birds who fly in flocks and fish who swim in schools and, and sea mammals in pods, and it's even the plants that will grow in clusters. If this is a survival mechanism of a, a carbon-based life form, we are not likely to change it. So advice to female entrepreneurs, um, the men will get the capital, the women are less likely to get the capital. To get the capital, seek out female funders. Right? It's truly that simple. It doesn't guarantee it. The women are still funding more men than women in conventional venture capital firms, but they're funding far more women than the men are. Okay? Yeah. And the number does continue to grow now, finally, in 2021. Okay, and we hope that it will continue in the future. I am seeing a burgeoning of funds that are being launched by women. Because they're new funds, they're very small, as is my own fund, right? I've just launched one. It doesn't get to be 100 million bucks for another five or 10 years. It doesn't get to be a billion or a trillion or more dollars as the top 25 firms, for example, all run by men, all funding men, right, are today. But it takes a while. So I don't get to see the end of this game. I get to plant the seed. You folks get to see the end of this game. You get to build it. Yes. Right. Right. So, so don't flag. When you become a millionaire, your first job is to put that hand back and to make sure the next generation does better. And even your colleagues of your own age groups do better. So um, think of it this way. Um, a woman walks into a room of uh, venture capitalists. They're all guys. Um, they are tall, white, American spoken, um, able bodied, uh, now a little elderly, um, slender, uh, males, mostly from Harvard and Stanford, two universities in the entire world. World, uh, with baritone voices. Okay, they're wearing blue jeans, dark t-shirts, and sport coats. And you're going to pitch a deal called uh, Joy Lux. Joy Lux is solving pelvic floor collapse. And you show them what looks like a fancy technological dildo and begin to explain it. Right. <laughs> and they're busy looking at each other and going, well, my wife doesn't and your wife doesn't and I don't know and, and, and so on and so forth, right? It's a funny example because really it's totally out of their purview. But it's time for us to stop shouting at these tall white guys and say they should do better. If you want the money to go to different hands, societally, the money must come from different hands. The object is to build more venture funds built by all people, all genders, all backgrounds all races, all creeds. And then they begin to understand the issues that are being presented to them because it's hubris for us as just individual humans to sit in the society and to think that we can understand um, all ideas, work with all founders, all management styles and build and support all companies. That's nonsense. The guys are doing a good job. Let them do the good job, do our job. Let's get it done. Jillian, you have a lot of questions flowing in and also... Uh, okay, I'll make short answers now so that we yes, can yeah. answer them. And, and there are questions. Senefer Mendoza is here. Senefer yes. is a female venture capitalist from Boston. <laughs> One of the finest folks. Um, she does due diligence that blows my mind. And uh, she and her husband, Adrian, are powerful VCs. Right. And they are, by the way, you can tell from the name Mendoza, also not tall white men. <laughs> so welcome, Senefer. <laughs> yes. So I just wanted to celebrate, celebrate Senefer. You know, we are celebrating all the VCs uh -huh. who are funding mm -hmm. startups. Now, Senefer funds both men and women. Yeah. She funds great ideas. It is not a gender lens focused fund, but they do actively seek women leaders and... <laughs> And Center for Rights Who Loves Jillian. It's a mutual admiration society here, folks. Um, but um, they, they fund um, really very powerful companies, not just here in the States, but beyond. Um, and uh, I'm a very strong fan of how they do their work. They're far more conventional in their VC approach. They do wait for the end game. We're doing different things um, at the Master's Fund, but these are very strong colleagues. So again, look at the different kinds of venture capital available to you. Make sure that you partner with a VC who's going to support you, not throw you out, right? And make sure that they understand your industry. Not every VC does that. Sometimes it's just capital. Same with venture debt. For example, um, lighter capital here in Seattle, Washington, literally says it's just capital. And then we get out of your way. They're quite certain about that. If that's what you need, you go to places like that. Venture debt is very different than venture capital. 
but both will capitalize the growth of your company. So what questions do we have? Yeah, and I just wanted to make a point. Uh, Sinopar might be investing in, in both men and women, but yes. when, when a company comes to her and you know a woman is uh, selling an idea for pelvic floor collapse, <laughs> she someone, gets it. <laughs> yeah, there is someone who is going to get it. There is someone who is going to understand that this is important for certain people. So, so here's the thing about that that funny story the end of that funny story is let's let's change out those guys and put in women instead and even if they're all 20 years old and they've never heard of this before and they never really thought about it before they get it in 20 seconds yes right? <laughs> they just intrinsically get it the point is that you find the right funder for the right founders we need to make more funders we are uh, you know at the master's fund our job is to to engender a thousand more women-led funds, whether they're gender lens focused or not, makes no difference, right? Our job is not to build a single fund. It's to engender more of them. Yes. Right. Yeah. Same thing. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Fallon is here is asking a okay. question. Have you seen an increase in women-led VCs and startups in the recent years? Absolutely, on both counts. Um, women are actually leading the return to entrepreneurship, uh, not necessarily in technology, but across the board in the United States. And they tend to do that after every recession. This was an interesting piece of information I hadn't known before. The Center for American Entrepreneurship reported way back in 2018 that we had the lowest uh, startups in the United States, number of startups in the United States since not, uh, in 44 years. So that's very worrisome. Those of us in technology think, oh, startups are all over the place. The deal flows everywhere. But in truth, across the board, technology and Main Street, if you will, or manufacturing, they are, um, it's very low. And it continues to be, of course. I have no idea how 2020 decimated that number. So we have to take another look at that. I'll be connecting with them again shortly. That group is located in Washington, D.C., if you want to connect and find out more. But what we are finding is, uh, what I'm reading is that, and this is the New York Times, so not difficult to find, right, that women are leading the uh, return from the recession with new entrepreneurships. Many of them, however, are little more than cottage industries. They may actually be operated out of their homes, so they would technically qualify qualifies cottage industry, but many people are doing that these days beyond the size of what was historically a cottage industry. Many service companies as well as product companies and some in the tech sector as well. We are seeing more women in the funding world, absolutely. So women led VCs and also women engaging in VC. Um, when I began some years ago, it was maybe 4%. I think we're up to about 8%. And Senator, if you're still there, maybe you can text that in if you know the number of women who are VCs and decision-making roles. It doesn't mean they have to be a managing director. But recently, I've been reading new numbers coming out from, you know, just the, the technology and the venture capital, um, uh, you know, things like PitchBook and so on that would uh, uh, publish these. So I'll be looking for 2021 numbers shortly, of course, as the year comes to a close. The answer in general is yes on both counts. There's an increase in women building and an increase in women funding. We now need to get more women to move from angel investment to venture capital investment. And on that, I would talk about agency over one's own capital. Even women who have built uh, fairly good sized companies, like, like myself, for example, when I left Moz, I came home with millions, right? I took that and I put it on the table and said, what shall we do with it? That was the conversation. If a man does the same, he might mention, by the way, I put a quarter of a million bucks into this new startup over there last week, whatever. He might, or he might not. It isn't that he dismisses his wife's input. It isn't that she cannot decide what to do with her own capital. It's the difference. There we go. Senator's got numbers on this, by the way, folks. 13% as of February 2020. These are women, female partners, and general partners in the funding world. So 13% much higher. So that is a significant increase, and we need to see it come up to about 51%. But that doesn't mean they will control the same amount of capital. It means that they are engaged in the process. So over time, right, that AUM, assets under management, is still way out of whack, right? <laughs> We're working on it. Um, okay, so um, when women come home, if you will, with capital, whether from salaries or from uh, entrepreneurship, right, they talk about what shall we do with it? 
This is somehow a, a either socially taught thing or visceral in the process in which we go to the well and talk to our colleagues and we put things in the community pot and do things. In the um, in the um, philanthropic sector, it's known that if you grant a dollar to somebody in the bottom billion, right, who earns less than two bucks a day, right, the bottom billion, and you give them a buck, if it's a woman, she's likely to, I don't know, find a, a chicken that she can buy with it. It will lay an egg and then she will feed somebody and then over time it will do something else. Maybe it will have a chicken and then she will have, right, she amplifies the health and the wealth of the family and the community. And if you do the same with a guy, almost always it goes to drink or a cigarette. So it's, you know, these are glittering generalities, rough numbers, and they're, they're hard to swallow. But we do know that women do things differently. This conversation about what should we do with capital versus simply making a decision is known as agency over your own capital. And it does not come, for whatever reason, naturally. It's something you should be thinking about at the early stage of your life. It's something you should be thinking about as you earn the capital through either your business or your salary and be setting aside capital and designing your own future. Are you managing your 401k? Are you managing your investment accounts? Do you have them yet? Do you let somebody else do it? In other words, a financial manager. If that's not your thing, and you're just an artist or a, um, I don't know, a chef or something, even in your business, money is not what you do, but you're kind of total wizard, the idea person, and you let somebody else do it, then make sure that you're working with somebody who understands your goals, understands your ethics, your morals, the whole bit, what you want to do and what you want to accomplish with your capital. And in that case, it's directed management of your own capital. But under no circumstances, always consider that a he partner would have the rights to do whatever and invest and whatever and sure that's okay, but that you do not. Too often it happens. Most of the wealth that is transferring now in the United States, more than $1.3 trillion from the uh, golden agers to baby boomers is actually in the hands of female golden agers now. 70% of female wealth is there, and that's because they are outliving their spouses. They may have earned it themselves, their spouses may have earned it. In most cases, the spouses have either earned it or inherited it, or the woman may have inherited it as well. Okay, But in that case, these women are very unlikely to have agency over their own capital. They have someone else managing it, and the manager is almost always a guy. So with that, it's a challenge to get these women to step up to the plate and to invest with their um, kind of their goals in mind, their social and civic goals as well. So we look to philanthropy and say, what about the philanthropic dollar being invested in venture capital? I'll come back in a year and I'll let you know how it works. The answer is these that conversations have been going on for about a year or two. They're continuing to amplify. We don't know whether this aging population of women will take what was a philanthropic dollar. We'll write, you know, a buck to the Red Cross and instead say, we're going to write a buck to a for-profit company through a fund that will invest in things we believe in, that we want to be part of the future world, whether they're healthcare company, child focused companies, uh, uh, femtech, whatever it might be, right? Uh, and many times it's around ecology, right, in order to preserve the planet. If they'll take philanthropic dollars and instead of giving it to a non-profit, give it to a for-profit sector to amplify itself, its returns would amplify and have a personal foundation that can amplify well beyond their lifetime. We'll see whether or not that happens. Bernstein Capital, among others, is talking to their investors about that. Um, and I know several other large investment firms are discussing that with their women uh, who uh, customers who are uh, investing. I was, you have, you know, you have been going on answering my next question and then my why and then my question after that. So this is one of okay. Helen's <laughs> Helen's comment for this comment she posted for, you know, when we were talking about uh, the pelvic floor collapsing and you said that even if they were uh, VCs who were in their 20s and who have no idea what it is and they they saw uh, an idea which was about something unrelated to them, they would still entertain that idea because... Well, what I was really saying is it isn't unrelated to them. If you own the anatomy, you know exactly what we're talking about. 
<laughs> even if you have not yet had a child. Yeah. But more than 80% of every woman who has ever had even one child will have pelvic floor collapse because we no longer agree to die at 40. If we did so, all would be well. But since we would like to continue on the planet for a little longer than that, right, something's got to give. Right? And now today, the only other options for pelvic floor collapse, which can be mild to severe, right? And if it's severe, draconian surgeries. That's it. Right. This person has figured out something that can prevent it and, you know, and so on, stave off this trouble that goes on for so long. Knowing that. Right. The question is, who are you going to present it to? Somebody who gets it or somebody who doesn't. What I'm really saying is match the deal. Right. If you're going to if you're running a company with, I don't know, an ecological impact in uh, farming, go find those people. Right. If you're making a short list of venture capitalists, don't just shoot it out to everybody. Find somebody who has invested in this space, who knows what they're talking about. Preferably, they invested in version one of what you're building version two of. Right. They've already had perhaps a happy exit with version one. They know that there's money to be made there and they know how to support it. And now they say, oh, look, this is the next generation. Sure, we'll dive in. You don't want one that's competing with what they have in their portfolio today. You want something that is complementary or version two. Yeah. Okay. And here's a question from Zach. Who mm -hmm. is, this question he asked like uh, almost an hour ago. <laughs> yeah. So he's asking about does VC always apply to speed to sell or is there a strategic long-term company or culture building approach to bet? Um, no, they don't always say you must sell early that very often they will want you to grow to be that billion dollar company. And so long term holds are common, by the way, the average time to exit is 11 to 15 years. This idea that everything comes in three to five, not anymore. This is no longer 2000. We're at 2021. That's a generation later. Um, so and again, it doesn't mean that every hold is going to be that long either. Um, so yes, there are VCs who have what they call patient capital. And you should look for that term patient capital. When they say so, that's probably what they mean. And they're willing to wait longer, right? They're willing to work with you over a longer period of time. VCs are not awful people. This idea, you know, they're sharks, this and that, the kind of the shark tank and so on. Yeah, we get that. But how should I say, a few bad actors will paint an entire industry. I'm not saying they're bad, all right? I'm saying make sure you understand the nature of the deal you're making, right? you do agree to serve at the pleasure of your board. Therefore, as you put your board together, of which VCs are a member and a strong member, right? Make sure that your um, goals and their goals align, that your ethics and their ethics align, right? All of those things have to come together, right? Once you have a good VC partner, they really can take you to a strong finish line. Okay. But if it isn't the kind of company you're building, look for alternate methods. Uh, I want to ask you a question. I have one or two questions on that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to, yeah, there are no other questions. So I get to ask my question. Okay. <laughs> Let's keep this here till then. You know, I love this. Who loves Chilean? Uh, so obviously, what are alternatives? Because people are so, you know, startups are so focused on getting capital, getting capital. Mm -hmm. they don't really, once they get capital, they don't really, many of them don't really think about the match in terms of values, match in terms mm -hmm. of culture, behavior. Right. So, yeah, it's hard to, um, it's hard to think about anything else but money when you don't have it. There's no question. I mean, that's whether it's in personal life or in corporate life, right? Yeah. When you are hungry, you can think of nothing but food. So um, I've been there. I know exactly what it feels like. It's difficult as hell. Okay. But um, how should I say the strength of character that is required um, is about that 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration thing. Yeah, you've got an idea and yeah, it's cool and all of that. Now, do you have what it takes to stay up late and, you know, day after day and day and so on and slog through the process of finding the right VC? 
right? That's the what cuts the wheat from the chaff, the winners from the losers. It's those who take the time. Um, I'll tell you a story about Moz. In the early days of Moz, it was self-funded. Um, I was the executor to my brilliant wizard son, and we were flopping around making all of these mistakes, and um, uh, things were very dark, uh, deep debt, all kinds of trouble. And during that time, he wrote the seomaz.org blog every night. seomaz.org was a dot org. We were never going to make money with that. We had a different consultancy on the side and so on. We were building a search engine optimization company. Um, he would write these uh, findings and, um, and theories and so on and, and demonstrate stuff that he was learning to his colleagues in the world of search because it was a new industry. And he was helping uh, without even knowing that he was becoming a thought leader. But he had agreed to do this every night and he did not telephone these things in. Everyone was well researched, well thought out, well written, graphs and charts and, and documented. Right? One night after he had done this, um, for some time. It was already uh, just shortly after Twitter had been launched. And he had a Twitter account at Rand Fish, and he had a Twitter account at SEO Moz at the time. I think it might have already been at Moz. And um, now it's probably at, at SEO Moz. Um, at that point, he wrote one evening, he posted under his own name at Rand Fish. He said, I'm exhausted. I don't know if I'm going to get this blog post up. And Quickly thereafter, two or three minutes later, SEO Moz responded on Twitter to at Rand Fish, don't even think about going to sleep until that thing is posted. And then 20 or 30 minutes later, maybe an hour later, he posted from himself, you know, that it was up. And then SEO Moz responded, okay, good, get some sleep. In the morning, the Twitter sphere, which was largely filled with people in the digital space, of course, and the SEO, because they hop in first, right, was saying, does anybody else think it's weird that Rand Fishkin is talking to himself on Twitter? They knew whose fingers it was. He ran both accounts, right? But he really was talking to himself. He was really putting it out there so he would have no opportunity to just let it go that night. He wrote that blog right, and researched it and published it every night for more than three years. Count those nights. That's more than a thousand and one nights of Scheherazade as if his life depended on it. And it did. That's what cuts the wheat from the chaff. That's the identity of a successful CEO. It's the one who shows up, right? Uh, the viral content, that's not once. Viral content is about sharing what you would give your left arm to know about if you didn't know it and you needed it to those who need it and to do it again and again and again without stopping, even though you are exhausted and those buckets are too heavy to carry. Wow. That is what it takes. My God, love, love, love that, love that. Zach is saying that, you know, the vulnerability. <laughs> Been there. Yeah. So oh. as his co-founder, I saw him do this. As his mother, I saw the price it took. That was tough. I used to say I watched him as he shouldered the mantle of a CEO and he stooped under its weight. You will stoop under its weight, right? Find somebody who cares enough. Don't, don't spoil your personal relationships on this. Make sure they're behind you. They don't understand what the hell you're going through, right? They're, they're not going to think like an entrepreneur unless they are one. The rest of the world doesn't think like we do. Get, get over that, if you will. Make sure that you honor where they're coming from, because trust me, they will carry you through this. They will. It's an important part of building a company. Now, Zach was saying, is there a way to test the waters? To yes, test the waters with PCs? Zach, can you say, is that yes, test the waters with VCs? Yes, he was He was talking about, okay. he asked this question when, when mm -hmm. we were talking about, you know, the, uh, yeah. uh, when you're so um, desperate for capital, how do you, and, right. and you are trying to see a match for you, how right. do you decide that this the is best, the best? The best due diligence you can do on your VCs is to call the leaders of the companies they funded. And fortunately, they publish that right on their website. Isn't that convenient? <laughs> so you go to ABC and you go look at the companies they've done it. You go, yeah, they're kind of in my space. Call that guy. Hey, Joe. Hey, Jane. Hey, Jill. <laughs> What's that? 
<laughs> you just ask them the tough questions. How is it? How is the process? How do you feel about it? Is it everything you hoped for? Are you having trouble with them on the board? Ask the important questions. Yep. Trust me, the VCs are going to do good, good due diligence on you. It's going to be grueling. Yeah. Do it the other way. <laughs> do it the other way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a great way to test the water. Oh, uh, uh, Zach is asking you about. You want to hear about the mom? Yeah, the mom son. It's a very unusual dynamic, right? There are fathers and sons and uncles and this and that, and brothers do things and even sisters do it and so on and so forth. Mother and son is still a strange relationship in business. I stayed only a reasonably short time, enough to get through the first funding. Um, and then I remained as kind of the corporate evangelist. Uh, it was the Rand and Jillian show, right? And so I left the office and I ran around the world uh, being this corporate evangelist, cementing the brand and everywhere from outer Mongolia to Sweden, right? It, it, it was a global brand. I took the more difficult to get to places, literally took longer to get there. Um, there were not uh, translators in booths and so on. There'd be perhaps somebody standing next to you phrase by phrase. You had to, you know, give this speech and so on. Those are more challenging. Um, for the Western Europe, uh, England and the United States, we built the brand of the internal staff by sending them out to speak. And in the end, it worked very well. Um, by design, my son and I were never in the same city at the same time, divide and conquer, right? He spoke also all over. Um, people would say, Mark Suster, for example, wrote a blog about, you know, don't be a conference hoe and uh, stay home and do your business. And uh, Rand wrote a very long response, kind of begging to differ. This is how we met our colleagues, but also how we met our customers, because we were building software that was powering the industry. We could ten then tell, have long conversations about what's working what's not working, what else do you need, you know, what's coming down the pike so that we could build to meet and suit. Um, but as a result, we would communicate a great deal through things like, you know, text and email and so on, or phone calls. Um, by the time I left, uh, I, you know, I would certainly well served my purpose, but truly, um, this was Rand's company. He was the wizard. It was his idea and I put him into the spotlight and I gave him the wind beneath his wings to fly, if you will, what any mother would do, right? Um, as again, I'm an executor, not the wizard. And I have served that role in a number of places. Certainly it was a great honor and a privilege to be able to do that for my own son. Yeah. And, and exactly. the other thing, by the way, my best tip in business for executors is when you choose your wizards, right? Know the metal you've got. In this case, I knew it from diapers up. Yeah, and, and yes, exactly. Zach, you are correct. We built an industry. And Kennedy and I, who now run the Master's Fund, we know that we were mindful of it, that we were building an industry, not just a company. Um, yeah. And these young people who built their early companies did become titans in that industry, not just Rand, but his colleagues as well. Yeah. And I want to clarify a question that you answered earlier. Uh, I misunderstood the question. Zach was asking obviously about VCs, but he was also asking about other board members. Mm -hmm. like I should like to point out that I like Zach and um, and I think Zach and I should talk more frequently. Um, and I like your dad too, Zach. <laughs> And uh, good colleague. However, I would like to point out that the women aren't asking questions. Come on, women, get in there and ask. <laughs> so they did, they did ask questions, and then they just Zach just went off. I know. Conversation. That's okay. That's okay. But yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, women, if you're still there and you're not nursing the baby, let's go. Um, in the meantime, about getting a board member before engaging. Yeah, that one's harder because you can't just kind of put them on the board and then not, if you will. But there is a way, actually. Make all your board memberships to your memberships. The board member that serves you today is not necessarily the board member that's going to serve you in even two years at the earliest stage of your company. They should earn their keep. You're going to be giving them some stock, which is earned over time, right? So it's uh, kind of you know, for the benefit of the company and so on. Um, even though it's a small piece of stock, it's worth doing that. I would say do some um, kind of long-term interviews and conversations uh, before you decide to bring somebody onto the board. Know why you're bringing them onto the board. Do they bring with them business acumen? Would they be better as an advisor? 
Are they bringing opening of doors to first customers or larger customers? Um, and again, if so, would it be better as a hired consultant, right? What is it they bring to the board in terms of strategic opportunity in addition to simply opening doors that um, would make it a board worthy seat? Um, finally, if it's not about those things like opening doors or even business strategy, do they bring a vertical knowledge wisdom or do they bring the wisdom of having built maybe a company that isn't even in your sector? Somehow that independent view, they're not in the forest. They can see, you know, they're not in the trees, rather they can see the whole forest, right? Perhaps that's what they bring to the table. Understand why you're asking them to get on the board. Sometimes it's literally just a big name. Then you just want to make sure they're kind of going to get out of your way and the title name itself on your board is going to help you raise capital, right? Just know what are they doing there? What do you need from them? And then, you know, decide whether or not they're going to be a challenge or a support. <laughs> you don't need to stop yet, Zach. You just need to, uh, you know, go encourage some others. <laughs> he has. He... Oh. Oh, so here is question my for everybody. Yes. Here is my uh, my question, and this is for everyone. First of all, I know you have many more questions. Everyone has many more questions. We have limited time. And however, Jillian is available to answer those questions in her podcast, which we should be talking about next, which is VC Confidential. Mm -hmm. And Jillian, can you quickly tell why mm -hmm. you should be listening to it, who you should be listening sure. to it, and anything else right. you want to talk about your right. second podcast? Right. Jillian, so Jillian, the, the, my, my, my first podcast, the earlier one was called CEO Coach, in which I said, this is all the mistakes I ever made, so you don't have to make them. And yeah, that's kind of a broad generality, and certainly we covered other things. If you're going to listen to that one, CEO Coach is available anywhere you're going to get your podcast. That's fine. It is launched, uh, excuse me, it is um, hosted, however, by WMR.FM. So you can start there, WMR.FM. Um, so uh, the CEO coach start from the most recent backwards because certainly stuff that was 10, 15 years ago already is not useful. And uh, the next one is CEO coach launched again with my partner Ann Kennedy in May of 2020. We are ripping the lid off this shrouded corner of investments called venture capital. It's very opaque and we want to make sure that people understand how it works, both from the investor side and from the entrepreneur side. So we talk about the different kinds of venture capital, how they operate, how you do things like l narrow your lists to the right kind of VC that uh, Zach's been talking about, and many other questions about VC. Um, and if you have a question about VC, hop in on our LinkedIn page. You just look for Outlines Venture Group on um, uh, LinkedIn. And again, it's Outlines Plural venture singular group and when you get to that page just type in the question you'd like us to answer and we'll check it out as we check the page you know right reasonably frequently but if you want to reach us personally um you can go to partners at masters.vc if it's kind of a you know question about uh, funding a company or individually i'm jillian with a g so it's spelled like gillian you can see that under my name uh you know under my image jillian at masters.vc or my business partner, Ann Kennedy, A-N-N-E at masters.vc. Thank you, Jillian. You are just, a, you. you I, I don't have words. Let's say you are just amazing. You're not. No, I'm, I'm just old. <laughs> I'm all out of estrogen and I've got a gun. <laughs> Just like the bumper stickers say. <laughs> Seriously, um, I am thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to talk to this next generation of both men and women who are helping to make things right. Um, do go to masters.vc, go to the about page, read the story of how we named the Sibylla Masters Fund. It's a good story, right? And it will inform you. It takes men and women to make it right. And when you do, all ships are raised. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jillian. And I'm going to, uh, all the links that you mentioned are going to be placed in the comment section of wherever I will post this podcast. Perfect. So everyone has direct access to those links. And Perfect. Okay. And I'll look forward to hearing from anybody who is here today or listening in later. Thank you, Jillian. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye.